So you've been listening to the nerds all day. This is the cool people. The bloggers and um, talking about social software. We've got some really interesting talks today. Um, we've got Paul Lenz from Thoughtplay. He's going to be talking about his um, philosophy behind being truly democratic using um, social software online. Um, Thoughtplay's website, Who Should You Vote For, reached what, almost a million people. Yeah, during the, Almost a million people. Um, I don't know. Sorry? How's that? Ah, I see. Sorry. So, did you hear any of that? Do you want me to repeat it? Paul Lenz, uh, he did um, Who Should You Vote For during the last election? Reached almost a million people. I don't know if any of you did it, but um, if I could vote here, I was supposed to vote with them. Seemingly with people. About 30%. It was. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can talk more about that there. Um, we also over here is Paul Mutton. Um, he's going to be talking about his IRC bot, um, High Spy, which basically kind of infers and visualizes social networks. He's currently using it to graph out the social framework of Big Brother. And he's going to talk about how um, this can be used in other ways. Um, but first up is my favorite blogger in the world. <laughs> and considering that Technorati tracks what, four, 14 million blogs, something like that, is saying something. Um, I, I love, uh, his, his blog is just absolutely compelling reading. He's a fantastic guy. When we first met, I think he um, took my blood pressure within the first five minutes. <laughs> um, it was no, just a cheap trick to me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a rather healthy one. It, it was 120 yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll let you. This is um, Tom Reynolds. Uh, uh, just to let you know, I've never used PowerPoint before, so uh, if it sucks, it looks happy, it's my fault. More into the Okay, yeah, so uh, Tom Reynolds, and I work around Fantasy Reality, which is uh, basically a lot about the ambulance service. Uh, first off, is there any lawyers? Yeah. We need to admit that they're lawyers. No? Good. Journalists? They must be some no, journalists? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Right, because then you can't contradict me. Um, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a journalist, I'm not I know nothing about employment law. Uh, what I do is where it says there, I drive around and I pick up drugs. <coughs> I'm occasionally take them to the hospital, sometimes talk to them first. Uh, but why I want to give this talk is basically uh, the job which I do has a lot of um, concerns about patient confidentiality and I've managed to get a blog which uh, my boss is quite happy with. Uh, if I swear, sorry. Uh, right, first of all, we've got some people who think that bloggers are special. Okay, I'm, I am to be not one of them. However, um, this person is. Uh, do you know who it is? Yeah, Ellis Simon A, uh, Delta Airlines uh, stewardess who got sacked for putting up some pictures on her blog. That's apparently the story. I'll come back to it in a little bit. So she got the sack. Uh, what did they do? They whined. And they moaned. And they wrote this wonderful little thing um, bloggers' rights. Yeah, bloggers are a special case. We should have extra special rights. And to be fair, I mean, No one should be fired because of their blog unless you can prove that there was intentional damage. Yeah. It's crazy. When really all we need to do is be sensible. Keep moving along. Uh, Scobles mentioned that um, the Microsoft has loads and loads of bloggers and they've got their own policy. This policy is basically don't be stupid. So I say, let's be sensible. <laughs> Just like that. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have to go on my journal and look for uh, cat pictures, but, you know, Drew to me. A lot of people think that if they remain anonymous, they won't be bothered by law, they won't be bothered by their boss finding out, they won't get the sack or anything. However, it's ties in quite well to uh, what Daniel Bryan was saying earlier this morning. 
which is you do get claims, you get people finding out about you. This is the rule that I start my blog with, right as if everyone knows who I am, everyone knows what I'm writing about. And so far, I've not been caught out, so I thought, so if you get found out, you'll wish that they, you'd written that your boss wasn't big, eared, fat, lazy, kid. Right. So if you want to be anonymous, that's all great. You can try and minimize your identity. Um, one of the ways to do it is use something called InvisiBlog, which offers free anonymous posting and blogging. The problem with this is, uh, I went and had a look on it, and the two most updated blogs were written by default. So if you want to hitch your cart to that particular horse, <laughs> be my guest. There's also anonymizer.com which has your IP address, I'm sure plenty of people around here know about that. It's great. Um, we use it on our mess and the service mess computers. Uh, to access the unofficial forums, which are technically banned. Oops. Here we go. Another way is to use pseudonyms. Okay, once again, don't call your boss when you get, because when you get found out, they might not be that happy. Um, obvious, really. And I don't find details. Now, this is where I've got my come up. When I first started blogging, I knew, knew who I was until um, I happened to swallow some blood. I happened to be able to try to be positive blood, and it tended to scare me a little. I put it up on the blog, uh, and people basically put two and two together and realised who was writing the blog, people who knew me. Great, I've got lost ball for it. So, what you've got to realise is if you're part of a community and you're blogging about this part of an employment community, uh, let's say you're one of seven naked sheep shearers in the country and you want to write a blog about that. Well, as I've six people, if they're looking for blogs about naked sheep shearing, they're going to come across your blog. So you will be read by your fellow new sheep shearers. Now, I've got quite a bit of this off of the EFF, which is great, especially for American, less good for us Brits. I don't know, I, I just like that picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's cute. <laughs> yeah, we got worried about that on defamation. This is why I asked if there was any lawyers. Um, like we're doing harm to someone's character. And there's a huge definition of uh, what I was, and uh, thanks to the BBC Action Network, I don't know what that is. Um, for those who don't know, exposing people to hatred, ridicule, contempt, causing them to be shunned or avoided, discredits them in their trade, business, or profession, or generally lowers them in the eyes of right thinking members of society. <laughs> As I would feel, right thinking members of society. <laughs> I'd like the record to know no one stuck their hand up. Like does count online if you write online and it's something libelous, the courts will come down on you like a ton of bricks. That's why to protect yourself against libel is to get your facts right. It's not libelous if it's not a lie. Just repeat rumours doesn't protect you. So if I read something particularly libelous in the sun and then go and republish it on my blog. I could get done in the laws as well. However, it does now a fair comment. As long as it's based on good faith, based on facts and published without malice. Now, if you look at those three, you think, well, hold up, I've occasionally read the Daily Mail. <laughs> Sun, you know, Garden, Spot, and mm, Facebook. Uh, the difference between you and the Daily Mail is. I don't know about you, but I've got about 50 quid in my bank account. Stay my ass space for a bit more. So the people who get liable by you will call down their heavy lawyers with their huge amounts of funding and wipe you off the face of the earth. And why would they wipe you off the face of this earth? 
because if you get prosecuted, you are one who has to prove you're innocent. It's one of the few cases in British law where you are guilty until you prove yourself innocent. And you're also not eligible for legal aid. Who still wants to write a blog? <laughs> so don't get caught lying. Oh. <laughs> I love Live Journal. Okay, reputation. Now we get into the things that um, your company is really interested in. And so our reputation. Uh, when I was on the radio, there was this crazy man who was uh, opposite me. And I was saying, our employee, lots of excellent. And he was saying, okay, they suck. Uh, the fact that he runs a company that teaches people how to talk on the radio, and you can hear that. And he called me a racist because of something that I've written on my blog. It wasn't, and you know, obviously it's not really. But that really did worry me because I thought, there's one thing in the urban service, I can understand it's me being a racist. And I got back home, there's an email waiting for me from the director of communications. Why me on He said, well, you're not racist, otherwise I would have written to you before I end. And not only would you not have a blog, you'd not have a job. The thing about blogging is this, right? If I go down to my mate's house and tell him my job sucks, they whip me, I suck people like that, they whip me, they feed me bread and water, they work me like Trojan and pay his friendly shit. But if I'm just telling me mate, that's fine. If I'm telling me mate to stand apart, that's also probably fine. If I paint in six foot letters on billboard, uh, they probably won't be too happy about that. And to be fair, putting it up on the internet means that I may as well get a gigantic big laser beam one night, hang it at the moon, and carve my message into the moon, because that's how many people are going to see it. So what you've got to be careful of is wrecking the reputation of the place where you work. <laughs> you know, I don't actually like cats. <laughs> Uh, companies as well as individuals have secrets. Um, for me, it's to do with patient confidentiality. Yeah. Uh, I've blogged about some of the things like how major insulin plants, uh, which is kind of topical now. Uh, but if you're working in a business which wants to actually get customers rather than have less customers, uh, white man, um, confidentiality, industrial secrets, all of that. Is it in the public interest to reveal those secrets? Well, if you just want to tell everyone that your boss wears women's underwear, assuming your boss is a woman, uh, it's not really in the public interest. But this doesn't emasculate the blog. You can still whistleblow. However, the best way to defend against whistleblowing is, in this case, I would go to the RSPCA and I would say, hey, hey, those pop tarts. And keep little cats in it. <laughs> then I'd blog about it. Because I've, you know, I've covered myself under the log. Do you know, should you ask a blog, post it notes, what I do. Make sure you don't give your boss an excuse to sack you, and that is one huge cat. <laughs> uh, going back to uh, Miss Simonetti, I've heard rumours. Oh, 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 rumours. The reason she was saying it wasn't because of the pictures which she is because she was a complete party animal. Uh, turning up late and turning up to never drink. I don't know. It's just a rumour. Please don't lie, woman. Uh, don't take me to court for libel. So, if you're going to blog, you're going to have to keep yourself white and white. Uh, don't turn up to wait, uh, work late. Don't call your boss a fat bastard. Uh, do a good job. And importantly, don't break your companies in their policy. If you're blogging from work, make sure you're allowed to. And uh, don't say on the job. Yeah, it's that. <laughs> and squirrels are uh, um, <coughs> If you think you're going to get in trouble, now I was lucky with this. I didn't even consider this and uh, I just asked forgiveness so I have permission. 
then it's probably best to ask for permission first. Go to your boss, give them all the evidence about all the good things that blogging does. Uh, look at Skyrocket, for instance, Chief Humanizing Officer of Microsoft. Uh, go to your boss, say, well, marketplaces of conversations, and brands are dead, and, and all that stuff that I have no idea about because I don't do marketing. Go to your boss and say, hey, boss, look, this, this thing's great, and can we get a policy about it? Login policy. Oh, yeah. Here's what I've said. Apart from the thing that uh, make clear that the views expressed in your blog are your life. It's all good, honest, common sense stuff. Be respectful. Be respectful of confidentiality. If you want a login policy, why do you need out of about fifty pound note? Slip it in your pocket. I'll work on for you. And if you do lose your job, slip it up. Perhaps your blog will help you find a new and better one. I know three people who got a job just because of their blog. That's three people I actually physically know, not people who I meet about. And your new job might be cheap here. Thank you. Oh, you can find me down the bar. I, I, I actually own it. I own it here. You it do own it, yeah. For the 7th of July. I don't know if you've read this book, but it, it, it's very good. You're remarkable. You people, I love you. So, I'm going to buy one of you. Now, let's have Paul. Are you standing up? Yes, I will. So he's going to explain his IRC bot. Hi, Spy. And I don't watch Big Brother, most people who work on TV, so this is just the middle of my head. Right, um, first of all, a quick thank you, because when I was asked to list my special requirements list, I actually jokingly wrote down beer, and I've got some beer. <laughs> it's nice and cold, but unfortunately there's no bottle in it, so someone's cut me out a bit later. Oh, they one scrambling in their pockets. Right, um, in case you've been living in a box and not watching television lately, <laughs> um, Big Brother is a program which is on Channel 4 at a reality television series. Basically, they've stuck 13 people in a house, lots of have no real career prospects, otherwise they want to stay at work. Um, every week, they, they vote one of them out, and um, if you're really, really interested in this, you can go and visit the official Channel 4 website. Um, so what this talk is about is social networks, we all know what they are pretty much. Basically, I'm going to be trying to create social networks that look like this, where people are represented by the little circles or nodes, and a link between those indicates some kind of relationship between those two people. Um, the problem with the Big Brother house is that, okay, you could watch it 24 hours a day and get a good idea of what's going on, but that's a bit sad. Um, <laughs> so, fortunately, someone else watches it 24 hours a day for me, um, and they, they try and pin what's going on. So I can actually um, read that stuff automatically and try and work out what's going on in the house. So the cool thing about creating this software is that I do not need to watch Big Brother. <laughs> so, working out who is actually um, interacting with whom is a bit of a tricky problem, and I originally applied this to IRC chat channels, which is very easy to work out who was saying what. It was obviously less easy to work out who they were saying it to. Um, so some of these simple heuristics. Um, heuristic is another word for bodgy guesswork. Um, so adjacency is one thing. If I say something here and then suddenly someone in the audience heckles, then there's a good chance that they were talking back to me. Um, of course, they could have just been whispering to their neighbour, ooh, I like that guy's t-shirt, where can I get one from? Um, so, that's not so reliable always. Direct addressing is something on IRC which is very easy to detect. So if Dave says, can someone ping me, and Phil actually says, Dave, okay, then I think you can guarantee that Phil is talking to Dave there. Um, there's some other ones which are a bit, a bit less um, in some cases. Um, indirect addressing detects when people are talking about other people rather than talking to them. 
and whether you should infer some kind of interaction between those two people is rather subjective. Um, and particularly applicable to IRC and other chat systems is this notion of temporal density. If only two people are actually saying stuff within a very short period of time, then they probably are talking to each other and not talking to anyone else. So that's quite reliable as well. Um, when it comes to actually laying out these networks, we want to make sure that unconnected nodes are not displayed because we don't care about being nomades. Um, people who are related to each other or there's some kind of interaction between them, they should be drawn close together so we can actually see that in the, in the graph drawing. <coughs> and the strength of the relationship can be shown using redundant cues, basically how close the nodes are to each other, um, less transparency in the lines that join them and, and bigger lines representing stronger relationships. Uh, all of the nodes have to be labelled because what is the point of a social network with no labels? Okay, it may look pretty, but if you can't identify who is who, then that's not so good. And all pairs of nodes must be separated. You don't want labels being occluded. So, uh, some of you may have seen this kind of thing before. We, we use this thing called spring embedder, which models each of those little circles as a charged particle. So, if you leave them all on their own, they'll try and push each other apart and just keep going forever and ever. Um, but where there's a relationship between two nodes, we treat that like a spring. So using an iterative simulation, we can actually uh, lay this stuff out until it reaches an equilibrium. Um, but we need some modifications because not all social networks are connected. You may have several distinct subgraphs, and there may be no way of actually traversing those to reach the other ones. So to stop those subgraphs from just drifting apart forever under the electrostatic forces, um, we just change the force model so that once they've got a certain distance apart, they, they, they just stop pushing each other apart. Um, don't worry about maths here. Um, basically, if there's a stronger relationship between a pair of nodes, then they'll be drawn closer together. So it's very easy to work out where the strongest relationships are. So here's an example of the kind of app, and this is actually from an IRC channel. Um, it's a bit small, so excuse me, but where's me? And from the little emanating edges, you can tell that I've been talking to three people. Um, unfortunately, only two of those are real people. One of them's a IRC bot, so I really need to get out there more. Um, but it gives you a feel of what's going on. We've, we've got a couple of stronger relationships down here, so that shows that those two pairs of people have been talking to each other a bit more than everyone else. You can also apply this kind of graph drawing layout to uh, channel similarity networks. So I know some of you here use the free node IRC network. And again, very, very small. Not even I can read it up here. But um, basically, where you've got stronger edges, you're showing channels which have a lot of shared participants in them. So uh, two of those closely related ones, uh, I think one would be a Linux channel, and one would be um, about Ubuntu or um, Shakespeare is a bit like IRC, although I think he came up with the idea before IRC. Um, this is what's it, Antony and Cleopatra, a book I have not read. However, from looking at this, I can see there's clearly something going on between Mark Antony and Cleopatra, which is you know, what you'd expect from the title of the book. But there's also something going on between Octavius Caesar and Mark Antony, who are misses. Um, and of course Shakespeare is like IRC, you can clearly, you, you've got a list of dialogue in essence, you can tell who is saying what, you can tell what they're saying, but again the problem is working out uh, who they're saying it to. And just another quick Shakespeare example, here is the Scottish play. Um, strong link between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth and Malcolm and Macduff. You can actually animate these things as the book goes by, so um, even without reading the book, if you look at an animation of this for a couple of minutes, you can actually work out who the main players are and um, where the main interactions lie. So yeah, how do we apply this to um, Big Brother? Um, as I said, there are some um, sad, there's, sorry, there's some talented people out there who actually type in what's going on and it appears on the Jizzle Spy website. Um, a mate of mine, Andy Sepka, he's made a simple IRC bot which pulls stuff off that website and feeds it into IRC. So all I had to do was modify um, 
my own IMC, but from the five spy slightly. Uh, all of the IMC diagrams are drawn using a version of this straight out of the box. Uh, but I modified it slightly so it would um, treat the Big Brother stuff slightly differently because um, basically you're getting stuff like Eugene says hello to Orla and things like that. It's very hard sometimes to work out um, who is actually saying what in that kind of context. But by breaking the sentences down, you try and work out which sentences involve more than one character and we infer relationships like that. Uh, then the IRC box stitch results on the web and everyone who likes Big Brother goes, ooh, this is pretty. <laughs> so this is what happened on day 18, or should I say day 18. Um, and it's a bit cluttered in the middle there because they're having such a good time. But one thing worth noting is you've got Mary and Leslie out here. They've actually been evicted from the house. So they don't form a part of that academic network in the middle. Um, curiously, though, Vanessa is still in the house at this point which obviously shows that she's quite boring. Uh, she was actually described as part of the furniture. And also, worth noting, is a very, very strong relationship between Saskia and Maxwell, who were, well, getting it on. Um, a couple of days later, there's a strong relationship between Roberto and Derek, who are the two oldest people in the house. Clearly, they feel a bit um, overwhelmed by all these young women snappers. And again, Leslie and Mary um, have been evicted, so they don't appear in that network. On um, around day 30, Big Brother actually introduced three new housemates. And here they are. They form a little triangle down there, because they've been stuck on their own for a couple of days. However, one of the housemates was introduced to them, Makozi, and she forms the only single link between the rest of the housemates and that small cluster there. Um, anyone else who's not, uh, not connected was actually voted out. So yeah, I mean, that might look pretty, but what, what use is all this stuff? Um, investigating criminal activity is, is quite a good one. Um, a guy called uh, Valdis Krebs, I think, he actually created a social network of the 9-11 um, hijackings. And by looking at the um, clusters in there, you could clearly identify uh, uh, clusters where people were on the same planes. Um, uh, more entertaining, it, it creates pretty diagrams, and we all like pretty diagrams, even if they don't mean anything. Um, there's also the educational use of graphs, you know, you can get a GCSE student and say, look, here's a Shakespeare play, two minutes later, they don't need to read the book anymore. <laughs> you, know, you, you don't even need to waste two hours watching the film. Um, and also, you know, you might better take some of this graph stuff and think, you can work out who's going to win Big Brother. So if you fancy a bit of a gamble, you know, just go on to that URL and place it there. Um, but I think the last word has to be that, um, well, uh, someone I know actually applied this kind of graph layout stuff to visualize the patterns of email being sent within this company. And um, that would put some very interesting artifacts. Um, visual inspection of these graphs really does show up suspicious stuff. This is why the police actually use um, graph layout mechanisms to detect suspicious activity. And he actually found a huge stream of emails traveling between two people. And um, as it turned out, they were having an affair. So, so the moral of the story is watch out, Big Brother is watching you. technical person in this room by several orders of magnitude. My background is in marketing, so whilst I found today very interesting, I've understood about one word in seven so far. Um, just a, a quick bit of background, uh, I, work, or I started a company called Thoughtplay, and one of our first projects was called Who Should I Vote For dot com. I don't know, just a quick show of hands, how many people here took, took tests on the site before the election? Wow, that's fantastic. Um, 
essentially the aim of that was to provide a genuine source of information to help people with democratic decision making, but also to try and use the techniques that are used in biomarketing for a social purpose as opposed to a pure commercial purpose. And essentially we constructed a whole set of rules about how a good bio campaign should work and applied it to the social model of the website, which might look ridiculously simple and technically amateurish, but whilst it probably is those things, there was an awful lot of thought that went behind it. Um, we seeded it by emailing out about 100 people on day one, and also quite a few people posted on live journal about 50 people. And this kind of ties into the whole idea of how blogs can transmit information as well. By the end of day one, 5,000 people had taken the survey. By the end of day two, 20,000 people have taken it. And by the end of day three, 100,000 people have taken it. We were the most popular political site in the country. And that was before any of the national media picked up on it. Then some little known technology newsletter called MTK put a link into us. Um, some people read that apparently. And also Popit featured us. And then we started in the national media. And so by the time the election came around, about 875,000 people had taken part. So we were totally blown away that, that something like that could work. And we got very interested in the idea of what big social groups of people can, can do in terms of communicating information to each other, but also in terms of um, how they can actually help us make decisions. Um, I don't know if any of you read the wisdom of crowds, but there's a lot of the philosophy from that we, we took to our learning. Our next project wasn't quite so socially motivated. It was uh, an attempt to use the ideas behind the wisdom of crowds to predict the winners of horse races using Google, which might seem a bit strange in the reflection it probably was. But the essential idea was that by looking at the frequency of trainer names, jockey names, and horse names uh, on Google, we could try and make some kind of inference about how, how much people were talking about these horses, trainers, jockeys, and therefore how successful they were. Um, so we modeled that fairly extensively and even put some money on it. Uh, astonishingly, we didn't actually win uh, anything. <laughs> I say anything, I mean, we didn't win up overall, we ended up down. But having said that, we actually did better than if you just backed the favorite in every race. So it was, that was kind of nice, but at the same time, it would have been fantastic just, you know, we were making a fortune from it. So that was a little bit of a diversion, and we thought, okay, that's, that's, that was interesting. But how can we take that idea of social information and do something, something more constructive and worthwhile with it that will benefit not just our potential bank balances, but other people as well? And um, what should I read next, which was finished coding about midnight last night, uh, has what is what sprung out of it. And essentially it's based on frustration with Amazon, and particularly in the function of Amazon that said people who bought this also bought that, implying that therefore you ought to like what that other thing is. There's obviously a lot of flaws in there in that people who shop on Amazon don't just buy stuff themselves, they buy it from other people. Also, they buy stuff they subsequently decide they don't like very much. So we thought, okay, Rather than have a retail system to help people based on weighted numbers what they should like to read or watch or listen to, how about we get people who are passionate about a collection of books to give us that information and then build a database on that that's searchable by other people who can go onto the site, type in the name of one or more books that they've liked, and then based on this mass constituency of readers who've read widely, they can then predict books that they haven't read that they would like. And that's kind of the essence behind um, what should I read next. So we haven't got very much data in here at the moment. As I say, I was up until about two punching in some, so it would maybe work for you. But by the end of next week, there's going to be a hell of a lot more in there. The, the idea is essentially that you go in, you stick in the name of an author or a title or both. Um, it then references the catalogue of Amazon so that you get an exact ISBN match so we can use that for the database. And it then cross-references with the database to see other people who've read that book and liked it, what other things they've liked. You get a better match by putting in more and more titles, and at the same time you grow the database. So the idea is to try and create something that expands exponentially and becomes better and better and better at recommending things to people. So, as I say, there's not very much in there at the moment. To get the data, um, we also run a publishing company, and we've been soliciting from our website 
lists from hundreds and hundreds of people, we've been circulating it around blogs, we've been circulating it around our friends. Um, so I know if I type in Pearl Earrings, um, Crazy Chevalier Book Girl Pearl Earring, I'll click search. Oh, that is really good. Oh, no, it's even with my crass misspelling, it has still managed to successfully match Tracy Chevalier Girl with Pearl Earrings. So I click on that. It says, okay, my favorite books so far. You can add more titles to refine the search, or you can click on what should I read next. And it was crossed. It comes back with a selection of different things, and these are me, Ron Sportsman, Vast Palace, Virgin Blue, um, Tully. One thing is, I mean, showing another Tracy Chevalier title in there, and something that we might well do is actually filter out titles by the same author on the grounds that the chances are you would have thought to check out books by authors that you like already. And the idea is that it's going to be slightly serendipitous that that mass of people will be able to communicate to you um, titles that you never would have heard of by authors that you haven't heard of. We also have to factor for the Harry Potter syndrome in that Harry Potter is going to appear on an awful lot of people's lists. So the, uh, the calculation that goes on in the background to determine what the most successful things are does take into account the overall instance of a title and wait for that. Because otherwise, you know, if you try and search for a book that appears on 10 lists with Harry Potter, um, it might just be an indication that Harry Potter is on one in every five lists. So there's a little bit of factoring in there. In terms of taking things forward, this is, if it works and people get into it and it's successful, that's fantastic. But what we really want to do is try and get a crossover between the virtual world and the real world in terms of publishing. As I say, we run a publishing company called Preferred, and there's a free book for anyone who would like it. Um, and one thing that we found is that we're overwhelmed with manuscripts, most of which are perfectly publishable and perfectly readable, but we simply can't publish everything that we get that's reasonable to publish. So what we're looking to do is actually create a democratic publishing model which would use fundable.org so that if you get 100 people to each pledge five pounds or six pounds or whatever, some happens to be, but certainly a relatively trivial amount. Uh, I should go back a step. Basically, we stick up our PDFs of the, book, of the text of hundreds of books that we've seen, which we think are publishable. People go on there, if they find stuff that they like, they can then link into fundable.org, each pledge six quid or so, uh, when it gets to a critical mass, so it's a bit like pledge bank in this respect, but it has a commitment factor, then if it gets to say 100 people, that will trigger us to actually use printing on demand to print the book, it'll get listed on Amazon, it'll get listed in the wholesale catalogs, and also we'll send everybody who signs up um, a signed copy by the author. So that's kind of where we want to take the next step along to actually make it so that authors who don't stand a chance in hell of getting published at the moment can at least get a little foot in the door and get a foot in the door based on public opinion. And maybe if enough people buy it, enough people like it, and it gets good enough reviews on Amazon, then a big publishing company will come in and pick it up and promote it properly. So hopefully at the end of this year that's something that we'll put together. I think that's about it. Thanks. So, I mean, yeah, at the moment it's just like, it, it feels as though it ought to work, and it's, and it's not bounty publishing, and the author can't just go in there and be the person who pledges it. Maybe they've got a hundred friends together who will each pledge six quid, which is so fair enough, then they kind of deserve to be published if they're that passionate about what they're doing. So, that's, that's kind of the next step we want to take it to. So, I'm, I'm going to stay with you, actually, just because it's easier. Um, uh, on your site, and I'll, I'll open it up to questions. You in, in a second. How many people are you going to need to use that before, like, what should I read next, before it becomes really, really valuable? Uh, I guess we need about, I mean, from the, from the list that we've already got, we've got about 5,000 titles, which is sounds like a lot, but actually in terms of books, it's pretty it's a relatively small proportion. I'm guessing we probably need about 5,000 people to have have actively entered in a list of, you know, say a dozen titles or so. You can just put in a single title, but obviously we'd much rather people add in more to help build the community and build the connections. Um, I'm, I'm going to open it up to you guys right now. Yes, it, it, can someone um, um, take the... Can you shout? Uh, can I have a few questions? Can I put in the list of ITBNs? 
You can't, but you can email it to us and we can because we have an interface that is ISBN driven. Um, we're guessing that most people aren't, or wouldn't necessarily go to the trouble of going on trams or whatever and cutting and pasting the ISBNs. They much, would much prefer a simple, you know, type of author interface. But certainly, you, we're more than happy to accept email at this size. The ISBN is a hell of a lot easier for us to do it that way. Have you, have you considered doing the same? I, I mean, I realise you've got a lot of your hands already, but have you considered doing the same thing with the Um our next project, our kind of interim project of this works might well be uh, what should I listen to next and also what should I watch next based on the same principles. But we, we want to give this one a work see, see how it goes first. But we can use the same platform. It's just a case of a different skill on it and then starting to populate a database. But I, I presume you know of Last FM. Sorry? Last FM. Are you aware of them? No, I'm not actually. Oh, well, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> They, they have a plug-in for most of the common music players, and they basically just watch what you're listening to right. and then draw the same conclusions. Oh, that's good. Um, the problem with books is there's no plug-in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, you are getting, I mean, it sounds like a fantastic model, but you're getting a relatively niche. You're, getting, you're, getting, you're not getting everybody who necessarily listens to music, you're getting a certain constituency. Uh, go and have a look, it's, it's actually really interesting. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and a quick comment about this, which is, uh, I'd really like to be able to just say, yes, I've already read that one. Um, when it suggests something I should read. Yeah, I mean, we can, I mean, ideally, if you put in a list of lots of things that you like, then you could do that. But uh, as I say, this is still our uh, Hexy so it's beta version, and we're still first just testing it. But yeah, I mean, uh, if we, if we, that sounds like a very sensible thing to add in there, and uh, we, can, we can look to put it in. So that you can just look, you know, tick the box, uh, highlight a video up or whatever, so that it just filters that out. Then can you get the woman with the red belt? Yes, what about attempts to sabotage the system to fill it with junk or whatever? Are you going to be especially vigilant, and if so, how? Um, we, we can see everything that's being put in, and so if someone's obviously trying to skew it, then we can bring this from it. So, I mean, we, we can just basically watch what's going into the database, and I think if someone is deliberately, if they tedious enough to want to do that, then, then we can intercept it. But I think it's a way to numbers thing, but if a sufficiently large number of people are genuinely using the site, and even if a minority try and sabotage it, they'll be outweighed by the mass of decent users. Would there be some mileage into putting as well the books you know to see what happens? That is a really interesting thought, I like that one there actually, because you could equally have glory, which is don't associate me with things that books I haven't liked. Well, if you hate this book, you might hate these other books as well. <laughs> <laughs> if you hated this book, then we're not going to bother suggesting uh, this, this set, subset of books, because they, they're, also, they're ones that people who hate it, who love the books that you hate also love. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Mark. Really want to use in my colleges. Um, please, please don't put it in PDF file. Please find somewhere putting it on that isn't PDF. Oh, well, you mean the whole, if you get to the, the, yeah, the, the critical mass. Oh, no, yeah, well, we can put it up there as a TXT or, you know, anything. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, have you considered um, mining that data and having other potential uses other than just uh, suggesting other books that I might like, somebody might like, other potential uses? I think if well, once we get to a certain critical mass, there's some really interesting trends that can be drawn in terms of the types of associations that people make, and, the, and it probably will help overcome some preconceptions about types of readers, because there is this perception that you get people who read literature with a big L, but never read Jackie Collins. And I think that what we'll find out is that there are all, there's an awful lot of crossover, and there's no such thing as a, a typical reader, that people might read a lot more promiscuously than one might expect. What about the useful data around it, like uh, the lists, um, people's wish lists, which do provide sort of coherent assemblies of books that they like? Yeah. Um, are, you, are, you, are you very wary of using that because it's theirs? Or? Oh, well, you actually like going into Amazon and yeah, writing it. Because you would, uh, uh, to be honest, I don't know if we can actually go in and can track down people's wish lists without knowing what their, yeah. their, their login ID was. <laughs> 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 
we go from an email address to uh, to an ID to a wish list? Right. Well, without knowing lots and lots of people, I mean, we actually know we've got a fairly big load of email addresses from the feeder site, but I think it would be kind of ethical to use that to learn my names. But there are also publicly visible lists of my favourite books, my favourite Spanish novels. That's certainly something, we, yeah. I mean, with the, the, the list mania function on Amazon. Yeah. Um, we do, we've had a look at that, and essentially, some of them seem to be really quite good. A lot of them are my. 12 favorite Harry Potter books, which are just all the Harry Potter books and then books about Harry Potter. And it's, so it's, it's not something you comprehensively might, I think it's something that you could selectively might. Um, I think I'd have to talk to our IP lawyer about whether we could legally do that, or rather, if we did it, whether we'd get found out or not, which is probably no. You had a question in the back. Oh, you might have to shout to let's um, keep the microphone. Have you thought of allowing uh, users to tag books with um, categories like these um, these equivalent sites for um, tagging websites like Delicious, where users are able to make up their own tags. So you can say it's politics and I don't know UK or and then. Do you mean by genre? Know, sorry. Do you mean by genre? Yes, because someone might um, share uh, favourites uh, with me in a particular, in some sort of uh, non-fiction, but have a completely different set of interests in, in the fiction world. So if I was able to tag and say, I'm interested in what they tag as being the thing I'm interested in. Right, so basically you're saying that you could have um, specific inclusions and specific exclusions. For instance, I don't want to see any books about political science because it's not interested in political science. However, I am interested in art history as well as fiction. So, by all means, show me art history books that people would like the same fiction books that I've loved. Um, but don't want to show me political science books because I'm not interested in it. I think that's, I mean, that's certainly something we could do. In the first instance, we're mindful of keeping it just really, really clean and simple because we just want people to be able to use it and hopefully get benefit. But there's no reason why we couldn't expand it and have a more advanced search facility on there that, that does apply some of that filtering. Yes. Do you know, I, I mean, this, this is from the sound that Amazon patented the, the concept of recommending a recommending a purchase to somebody based on what other people who made that purchase bought. Do you know how close you are to that or which to be honest, we, I mean, they've got transaction history of you know eight years with millions and millions of records on there. As I said, we're going to be, we, yeah, we're going to have five or six thousand, and we are, I only had two hours between midnight and two a.m. to start punching the data this you know, last night. So we're not at that stage yet. But hopefully by the end of this week, we can start doing some comparative analysis and seeing how how different it is to what Amazon recommends. Certainly. Well, it's just I was just reading, technically speaking, how close how close are you to the to the fact they have this patent or to what they patented. Oh, have they patented the system? Yeah, this is where I have obviously no technical knowledge, but um, I mean, we're just using some, some fairly straightforward analysis that I understand it, which I can't imagine is, is patentable because it's. <laughs> or I could well be expressing my total lack of knowledge about this, but essentially it's just looking, it's looking at incidence weighting. And just analysing it, it's just a good, I mean, people who coded it just can't come up with it based on common sense. Yes. Question for the other ball. I just wanted to tell you validate the results of this robot without watching the program. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll watch it a little bit. <laughs> it, it, it is all very subjective that kind of thing. But on the whole, um, there's a lot of people on the digital spy forums that follow these graphs and they do actually agree with um, on the whole they agree with what the graphs actually represent. Did it predict the winner? Sorry? Did it predict the winner? Uh, well, it's still running at the moment. Okay. So. <laughs> can, it, can it help you predict the next submission? I don't know. Um, possibly not. But um, it's, it certainly shows the people who are less active. Um, I would uh, conjecture that the people who are less active in the community are less likely to be evicted immediately because it's only the people who are really annoying who get voted out straight away. And they're the people that do actually interact a lot. So, so perhaps you can. Oh, you have a question. Yeah. Oh, I think um, we're... Uh, a question for both Pauls, actually. Uh, Paul Mutton, is there any hope... Mutton, uh, Mutton. Mutton. Um, is there any hope for the sort of graphs you've been showing us today in connection with what the other Paul is doing? Because I've never seen anything like that. Um, yeah, uh, graphs are amenable to all sorts of things. Um, yeah, there's an obvious connection that you could use the same connection system to plot 
associated with <laughs> <laughs> you, you certainly can. Um, but perhaps graphs of fewer than 100 nodes are probably best to actually visualize. Once you start going beyond that, um, you, you can feasibly draw them because some algorithms do have um, n log n time complexity. But they are just a nightmare to actually look at, and you get lines crossing all over the place. So, so for small stuff like the, the big rubber stuff, they're quite easy to, uh, to look at. If you're looking at just a few books and a few people, then yeah. Or could you apply a filter that says actually anything less, that has less than five or ten connections will just ignore? So that then it's only the kind of the really the really popular books without wishing to necessarily focus on that. You could then look at the connections between bestsellers, for instance, and if one's going particularly sad, one could try and analyze different characteristics that explain why these types of books appeal to similar types of people, why there are no connections between them. Yeah, I mean, you can break down graphs in all sorts of ways to make them easily visualizable. You can break down in a hierarchical fashion, or um, uh, things like the Visual Thesaurus and um, visualthesaurus.com, I think they Check that out, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, how you can navigate large graphs that only show a small portion of the answer. Well, I've got a question for a So, if you're doing sentence analysis to see whether the connection between those are positive or negative? Um, no, this is the um, interesting thing about it, really. It's, it's definitely not rocket science. Um, it's a very, very simple method to work out where the um, inferred relationships are, and I would guess that yeah, maybe there are some um, situations where it makes a wrong guess. But um, it also incorporates a temporal decay thing, so as time goes by, the link between the uh, nodes actually deteriorates until eventually it breaks. So um, even if there are some false, false starts on your guessing front, it will eventually sort itself out over time. Considering how simple it is to actually, how simple it was to make these heuristics, um, I think it's quite impressive how it produces reasonably realistic graphs. Yes. Yes. Um, just Paul, on the social uh, networks, have you ever run it on the UK parliamentary debate record? Ah, that's an interesting question. It's something I did think about. Um, a couple of years ago, and I was just speaking to one of the, um, the UC R and D guys earlier about it, um, and it looks like something that might be happening quite soon. Is, is your software open source? Uh, yeah, it's all open source. If you want to download the uh, high spy bot, which is the thing which will draw the graphs of IRC, you can actually get that from uh, www.jibble.org slash high spy. Um, if you want the version which does the big brother stuff, that's not on the web at the moment, so you can just email me for it. Seems like the other session is coming out. Is that the case? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I think we'll wrap up. If you have, if you want to talk to any of these guys, I'm sure. If you have. Can I just make it very quick now? Yes. Yes. I uh, just, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Danny O'Brien, subsequent to talk, has set up a pledge. She wants me to announce to you. I will create a standing order of five pounds per month to support an organisation that will campaign for digital rights in the UK, but only if a thousand other people will do so too. You can support this by uh, texting PLEDGE RIGHTS to 60022 or going to uh, www.pledgebank.com slash rights. Thanks for that. You all know. Lovely, thank you.